All right, everybody, we are live here at the Endurance School. Uh, Molly, Balf, and I are here today with Rach McBride, who we are incredibly excited to have. Uh, Rach, thank you so much for joining us today. I am super excited to be here. Am I your first guest on this talk TV talk show? You are our first guest. You're our first guest on uh, on any show. I think I think we've only really had ourselves on so far. Amazing. It's fun for people. <laughs> Yeah, as I, I as it. I said uh, earlier, or early this week, I said, hey, do you want to come on our wacky internet TV show? Uh, and I was, I knew you were the, I knew you were the right person to ask because you were, you were like, yes, <laughs> like right away. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, for those of you that are tuning in, um, Rach McBride is a professional uh, triathlete. Um, with with uh, with with probably too many results to uh, to put out there, but um, the big one was that they qualified for Kona um, earlier this year at a uh, at a race down under, um, and are a three time seventy point three champion, um, been on the podium of an Ironman. Um, and uh, Red Bull, uh, the Whistler Red Bull 400 uh, champion, and um, many, many other um, Palmeiras uh, races for Wadi Inc. And has, uh, and I've had the privilege of uh, training with them for, for a while, and, um, and is also one of uh, my closest friends in the sport, one of the people that I feel like I can say anything to. Um, and so that's uh, my side of the intro. I'm going to kick it over to Molly for uh, completing the introduction while I scan who is here joining us. Before I have to add, but I am um, just, a, just a super fan of, uh, of yours, Rach, so thank you so much for being on here. I got the chance to know you a little bit in our Tucson camps over the last couple of years. And um, to get to see your, your fierce mix of badassery and kindness that you've had for all of our athletes. And, like, and I've had athletes that I've worked with tell me about you standing on the finish line at Ironman Canada and giving out medals and like how much that's meant to them. And yeah, just a huge fan. And we're so happy to have you as our very first ever guest here at the Endurance School Community Spotlight. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, well, I'm super excited to be here too. And I have to say like, I, I, it was a no brainer that I wanted to come on your show because obviously I love the two of you so much and we have had such incredible times together. Um, like Tucson camp was always amazing. And, um, and I know bag and I, we have raced a whole bunch together as well. Um, raced some gravel together, which is always super fun. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, I'm just, super excited to be here with you guys. Um, Rach changed my um, sporting career for the better um, at the finish line of, of Wildflower a few years ago. Um, I had just had a really, a really, really frustrating race. And after the race, you and I were talking and, um, and I was just kind of going through what seemed like a recurring pattern in my racing. And Rach just looked at me and said, uh, maybe you should see a sports psychologist. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, that's really the sensible thing that somebody would do in this situation. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those like pieces of, of well proffered advice. Um, and I know that you have a background in doing some counseling work. And I just wanted to, I kind of wanted to launch in there and see like how I, this is the question I always ask people because I'm really interested in this. Um, how has how has that world kind of bled over into into your racing world? Gosh, that's a really good question. I mean, <clears throat> I think that well, I think that in like certain scenarios like that, especially in the world of coaching, it's like obviously like we are we are fellow we're friends and fellow competitors and sometimes like when it just takes someone else like hearing your story and hearing because you've got the story inside your own head right and so like hearing when you hear somebody else's story you obviously are like outside of them and can have a different perspective and be like and a different skill set too of like 
oh, hey, this is maybe a component of your training that like is a, is might be a good thing to tap into. And, um, and I think that for myself, like having an understanding of like counseling, it definitely helps in regards to like relationships with coaches mm -hmm. um, and relationships with, with other athletes. So I actually came into the sport um, as like a very fierce competitor, but as someone who probably was like based on, based on insecurity, thought that like showing any kind of like kindness or, or like not necessarily kindness, but like any, like being really hyper aware of like showing any soft spots to my competitors because that might be shown as weakness. Mm -hmm. And what I realized in racing is that um, once I started to become friends with my fellow competitors, it made me realize like how much more pleasant of a situation that was of like showing up at a start line with like people who I loved and really um, adored and like wanted to spend time with or like knew personally versus someone who I thought as like an adversary or someone who was an enemy of sorts and that I like had to like stay in my own little shell. Mm -hmm. And um, that I think is like, it's kind of, um, yeah, just like being able to understand that piece. Um, and uh, it is just like seriously changed who I am as a person, let alone as an athlete. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, that was central advice that you gave me. And I went and did see a sports psychologist and one who I continued to work with for a few years. And it, it really did, it made a real difference in the way that I felt about, about my own racing think kind of similarly to what you're talking about um that in the the years after that decision kind of like what you're talking about about changing your approach to your competitiveness um it made me value the races just so much more because i was coming at it less from this like i've got to get it right and more at like what does this mean for me kind of thing yeah 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 absolutely that's kind of how i've had to start thinking about these longer distance races too like what, since coming into Ironman, like for me, 70.3 was like, I kind of nailed it right off the bat. And, and it was like, okay, cool. I know I can do the, I like figured this out. I just need to like keep training and not, and like stay healthy and, and like I can do well. And then I, and then I moved into the iron distance and it was like a whole different world. And I wasn't good at it right off the bat. I mean, sure. I was like moderately successful, but, um, not to the like ability that I thought that I knew I was and am capable of, and it's, I've really had to start approaching. And I think Ironman New Zealand, for example, was like one of the first races where I showed up and just like actually didn't have a whole lot of expectations. It was like you know what I'm I was I was very calm going into the race and took it in a way of like let's just see what happens and you know try and just like. I had a specific component of the race that I wanted to focus on, which was nutrition. Mm -hmm. And um, and I just like, that was my focus. And it turned into like one of the, my, the best races of my life. Um, about about that race, we actually have a question from uh, one of one of your biggest fans, um, <laughs> Kirby, uh, Kirby Amaker, who is, uh, oh, who is wonderful. Um, but yeah. she wants to know, um, she first of all says congrats on the, on the Kona qualification. Um, Thank you, and Kirby. then how does, how, how good does that, how good does that feel to have that out of the way? And this is probably going to segue into Molly's next question. Um, but how does it, how good does it feel? And also what is it before all of this other stuff happened? How did it change your thinking about the rest of the year? Yeah. So I have to admit that going into this year, the past couple of years with the new qualification system, I hadn't, you know, I went through a year of like really focusing on qualifying for Kona. It was like all I wanted and I, and I made it there and um, it was a crazy experience. And then I was like, well, you know what, with this new system, I don't, I don't necessarily want to like focus my entire season on trying to qualify. If it happens, it happens. 
wonderful. Um, but like I have challenge Ross that I want to do and some other races that aren't necessarily like every single race is trying to qualify for Kona. And I have to admit, like qualifying in New Zealand has in, I mean, in the context now of what has happened with the mm-hmm. world and, and COVID-19, it was, it's really been like a game changer for me. Um, just like I didn't recognize like how much of an impact it would have on just how I feel about this year. So I am already so grateful that I have been able to race in 2020 um, that I had, you know, made the effort this year to finally check those New Zealand races off my bucket list, um, which is something I'd wanted to do for years. But because the races are so early, it meant like I had to shut things down super early last year and um which was really disappointing because like it was a tough decision because ross was my last race in july and i've been injured since august Mm. and i was really really trying to get another race in before the end of the year and i just like i wasn't healing wasn't healing wasn't healing and i just had to like finally pull the plug and so like having those having those races was like such a big deal for me because it felt like it was like coming back Mm-hmm. from racing i hadn't raced in uh yeah like since july i don't even know how many months that is but like over six months um and uh and just to get that qualification at such a spe- at such a special race and it's such a um in such a special country was uh was really wonderful and it's before then before like coming back home it really shifted my mindset of like you know what the rest of the season i can do whatever it kind of like opened this whole world of like i don't even need to do another iron man like i had thought about maybe racing after ross doing tromblon or something or even something you know in between before ross and was like you know what i don't even have to i don't have to do that i can like the world is my oyster kind of there are these epic gravel races that I want to do. I can totally just go and like race gravel for the rest of the year and then go to Kona. Um, Of course I was heading to Roth and everything, but um, so that would still be in the picture. But um, so on one hand, it like wasn't really going to change my season, but Mm -hmm. it just like, it gave me that freedom to just be like, you know what, I can just go and do, do whatever I want. Um, And uh, yeah. And it's just been, it also like, you know, I think for all of us in the world of sponsorship too, it's kind of, you know, a lot of sponsors really put Kona up on this pedestal. And so it's like, if having that qualification, it felt like a, almost like a a validation for the rest of the year of like sponsors were like still going to be on board and like even for 2021, um, And it also, having that qualification, like, it turns out, I guess I am the, um, when I compete in Kona, I will be one of seven female bodied athletes ever in the history of Kona to, um, over the age of 42 to, or 42 and over to hit the start line or to finish. So, like, that's pretty rad in a 40 year history to be one of seven. I think that's really, really cool. Awesome. Um, so that did actually tee up my next question. So thank you. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons why the endurance school exists and one of the reasons why we're here and, uh, and with you is that uh, because of all of this, we've been, we've been seeing a lot of shifts in, in priorities um, and some things that have come off of our tables. And, and then luckily that's made space for other things to come on. So even though, this is a tough time, no doubt. It's been a real opportunity to connect with community and to create this platform to be for people to kind of share and like be together even virtually. Um, so that's been something really good that's come out of this for us. What has come out of this time and what has changed in your um, in your day to day and what has like where has there like been room made for something? Like what has what have Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's funny. Um, I joke a lot that, like, aside from not being able to swim, there's not a whole lot that's really changed in, like, my day-to-day life because I don't really see a whole lot of people anyway. <laughs> um, and, uh, and like, I'm usually just, like, doing my workouts, doing my bikes and runs and 
uh, eating lots of food and hanging out at home. And so, um, however, what, I mean, I think when you take all of this racing off of, I, I'm basically like in my head, I'm just like, you know what, the rest of the year, I'm not, I don't want to like, I'm not hanging on to any race right now that it's going to happen this year. I'm basically like the rest of the year might be a total write off in terms of racing. However, I know that, um, so, so what it's changed for me is right now, there's definitely less of a focus on specific structure to work out. Um, I am much more laissez-faire about things. I'm exploring more. So I am so grateful that I live in this incredible place in Vancouver where I have access to amazing trails that I can like hit out on my gravel bike or um, for running. And so I'm, I'm like just going, going out and exploring a little bit more and not taking my workout so seriously. It's like, I don't, I don't really feel like doing structured intervals right now and that's okay. Um, however, I know that it's still important to stay fit and to, um, um, you know, basically going out and just like doing, you know, riding up mountains or doing hilly rides. And that's kind of like intervals enough for me right now. And really kind of letting myself off the hook, like letting my brain off the hook and letting my body off the hook in terms of dealing with like that super structured training. Um, and uh, and it's also um, allowed me to be a little bit more creative with like the strength stuff that I'm doing right now. So usually I'm not doing a whole lot of strength um, at this point if I'm like leading up into an Ironman build. But um you know, with the gyms closed and all of that, it's like, well, I'm doing core a lot more, which is probably something I should be doing <laughs> anyway. Um, and do like having fun workouts. Um, you know, my girlfriend, Steph and I do like core workouts, um, multiple times a week together. And, uh, and so it's, yeah, it's just kind of like, it's opened up some space as well. I have a, um, uh, I have this like this growing creativity urge in me over the past couple of years and it's allowing me to um, to hopefully like explore that a little bit more um, see what I can do play my cello a little bit more and also um, just the space you know right now in the world of, of like of sponsors and um, everything, us sort of connecting more on the internet and being a lot more um, on social, it's actually allowed me to, um, I have some stories that I want to tell and I have things that I want to talk about, but I usually, because I'm usually very in the middle of training and I, I don't feel like I have the time to do that, right now I feel like, you know, they're, people are looking for content and looking mm. for things um, to to publish and I think it's really um, inspired me to start working on my stories and telling the stories that I want to talk about so whether that's like gender identity and being a non-binary athlete in, in the binary sport or being an athlete in my 40s those sorts of stories are like the ones that I want to start talking about and really getting out there and I think that it's really important like this point in time right now is where I think we're going to see a big divide between people and athletes. Like those athletes who really love like sport and love just like getting out there and, and doing it are going to survive through this, who like love the training. Um, those athletes who are in it just for the racing and the, the glory of racing are, you know, are people who may not survive through this time period. Um, and I think it's, um, it's a time where we're really going to see some folks, uh, yeah, sort of rise to the top and be able to, um, as, uh, gosh, Lisa Bentley just sent me a really wonderful, um, email and I'm trying to remember what she, how she, um, phrased it. It was like, it, it's like some people are just going to kind of coast and other, other folks are going to be able to like continue to build themselves up and either mm. whether it's their brand or their fitness or their strength or whatever like yeah it's it's like I want to be one of these people who can who can still um, 
who is going to come out of this all stronger and um, as like a much happier and, and frankly, well-rounded person. <laughs> What's the story that you would most want to tell about being a non-binary athlete? Well, I think for me, the biggest thing is really just awareness. So one thing that I've found has really changed my idea of like my perspective in sport is, um, is uh, like coming, grasping on and um, just, really recognizing like who I am as a person and the identity that I feel like I've had for my whole life and really putting words to that and recon and like once I've, I've realized and people around me as well have, have um, talked about the same experiences. Like once you start to recognize where gendered language is in, in our sport or even just in our day to day where it really doesn't need to be, um, then it, it's a really interesting experience to like all of a sudden, you know, it's just that awareness. And, and basically I just want, I want to, I want to um, just create more awareness around that, around that and understanding like just where, like where it might be important to use gendered language and where it might be appropriate like not to and just how it sort of fits in sport because I think the I think the conversation um, is you know obviously there's a lot of conversation now around trans, trans athletes and uh, and how they fit into the world of sport and I think that um, you know non-binary folks are sort of in one hand like a bit of a forgotten not necessarily forgotten, but it's like a smaller piece of the puzzle that it's like, actually there, are, you know, let's, let's think about ways where, how we can make sport a more inclusive place for all identities. Nice. Yeah. We have some awesome questions in the chat as well. Um, Amazing. So, yeah, we have two really good ones um, that I've seen so far. So first is again from Kirby. Um, and she wants to know, uh, what do you want your legacy to be um, at some point in the future when you look back on your pro triathlon career? Yeah, gosh. Um, well, <clears throat> I mean, I think I want to be, my, I think the legacy that I want to leave is like to be an inspiration that you can be whoever the heck you want to be in sport and you can look however you want to look you can um whatever kind of identity that you want to have there is a place for you in sport um and uh yeah i just i think that has been the biggest thing for me is understanding that like it's okay to be exactly who i am i may not look like anybody else in the sport that i am doing um and that's okay uh, to just like for everyone to have the confidence and to have for everyone to have the acceptance of, of other people. I mean, I feel like I am, I've been trying to, yeah, just like just that ability for that freedom of expression in, in sport. Uh, and this, this next question you may, you may have just answered, but, uh, but we'll see, we'll see if there's another, yeah. another layer, but, um, if you were to go back and uh, uh, tell your 13-year-old self some great advice, uh, what would it be? <laughs> um, you know, I always struggle with this question because, like, I feel like there are – there. I came through an incredibly circuitous path to, like, get to where I am right now. And I don't know if I would have ended up here if I hadn't gone through, like, all of the – the roller coasters and the you know relationships and the different careers that I I would have um, if you know I think the the biggest thing that pops to my head as the thirteen like for my thirteen year old self would just be to like you know be be confident in in who you are and um, and just follow your heart like follow what follow your passion and don't do things for anybody else 
because you know what what your friends and your family want for you is really just to be happy they don't give a shit whether you're going to like be a doctor or you know be someone who makes a lot of money or you know your your own your success is defined by you not by anybody else um yeah and I probably would have, like, I, I, I don't think I would be here. If I followed what I wanted to do as a 13-year-old, and, like, I probably would have graduated from high school and uh, become a horse trainer or something, I think. Okay, I can't, I can't, I can't let that one go by. Um, <laughs> what did you, what did you think that you, when you were 13, what did you think that you were going to be doing when you were 40, 42? Gosh, well, I don't think I really thought about, like, past the year 2000. I remember when I was, like, as a young teenager just being like, oh, my God, two, year 2000, I'm going to be, like, 20-something. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be so old. Um, so I never thought, I never, ever even thought about what I would be doing in my 40s. But uh, I was way too short-sighted. Um, but I think... I mean, I was like super passionate about horses at that point, and I and I love animals. And I, you know, I think I graduated high school and thought, oh, what's the like the fanciest thing I could do with like be with including animals in my life? And it was a veterinarian. And uh, um, I think in retrospect, like. I mean, I think I probably would have been a great veterinarian, uh, it, but, you know, I could even have just, like, I don't know, like, had a rescue farm or, like, you know, worked worked in, like, a, on, like, a horse ranch or something. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I keep saying it's not like somehow I'm going to incorporate horses back into my life somehow. Um, and at least like, at, at least I need to get a dog or a cat or something. When I was looking at your website um, in preparation for this, I, I, I was like, Rach really is the most interesting person in training. And I was like, I knew about the cello and I knew about the two PhDs and like, I knew about the like riding the bike super fast and all that stuff. And then in the middle of your site is like, you're a picture of, I assume you jumping on a horse. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's one, a chat in the, or a question in the chat that I don't think came through. I must've reconnected. Bag, can you see Matthew's question? Yeah. So um, this is always a, this is, this is always a, an evergreen and wonderful question. Um, but, um, Matthew Greenberg wants to know, um, what is your, what is your current favorite food to be eating right now? Right now? Yeah. Um, well, you know, there is like, I don't, I, I feel like there's been like a 1000% a increase in the people, um, making sourdough bread at home and, yes. uh, <laughs> since COVID. Um, and Steph is that I actually brought from my sister-in-law who was making sourdough, a starter for Steph, who was really interested in making sourdough. And so now Steph is making sourdough, uh, and it's amazing. I mean, we've already, we've also had sourdough pancakes, mm. which were incredible, like probably the best pancakes that I've had. And tomorrow morning, I've heard there's a rumor that we're going to have sourdough cinnamon rolls. Um, so yeah, I'm like all about the sourdough right now. Usually I can't, I, I'm not supposed to be eating gluten. I try and try not to eat so much flour, but right now I'm just eating all of the gluten in the sourdough. <laughs> Necessary in times like these. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, ha we have a question from Molly's brother, um, who on, tw on Twitch goes by the um, the the totally not threatening name Assassin Wog? Uh, <laughs> it's because he loves Assassin's Creed, not because he's terrifying. <laughs> um, so, 
um, what Paul wants to know is um, that he works with young people, some of whom are determining their gender identities. Um, as somebody with a background in counseling, what advice might you give to help people um, supporting those kids who are making those decisions? So this is a, what would you say to the support structure? To the support, yeah. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I think to, I think what's important for kids is like to, to listen, really, to listen to the kids and to respect how they identify. So I think if someone wants to identify as a different pronoun, if they want to identify with, as a different name, to to respect that and ab until you, till you hear differently to you know that I think is the biggest way that you can show your support is actually by acknowledging uh, the changes that those young folks want and it's like it may be that that someone wants to go by those different pronouns for the rest of their lives and it may be that like it's just for the next month but I think that to for for kids to be able to explore their identity, it's just like it's like anything, right? It's like what you want to do in your life, the career that you want to have, the um, your sexuality, like those things are they it fluctuates, it changes over time, and so to allow, especially for youth who are just like trying to figure it all out, um, just to to have that level of respect um, and ask questions, like don't make assumptions. So, yeah, that would be what what I would think. I feel like that's great advice for teenagers everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Find out who they are. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know, as a as a teenager, I know that for anything in my life, I I think I just I didn't necessarily have the courage to like say to, like to communicate what I was feeling inside. But I knew that if somebody asked me the right questions and allowed me the space to like to express myself and and I felt like it was a safe place that I probably could have like accessed a whole lot more um uh like been a lot have gained a lot more confidence and just like yeah no like been a better known myself a little bit more and had some really like probably much more wonderful connections with the adults in my life you just got a resounding yes from Ashlyn Mack um. <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, and Janet Furman wants you to be her dissertation coach. <laughs> I'm glad you got your schedule, your meeting rescheduled, Janet. <laughs> um, I've got a, uh, I've got a swim, I've got a swim question. Um, oh, yeah. so, um, obviously not many of us are swimming at the moment. Um, Molly and I are throwing all sorts of wacky stretch cord workouts and mobility stuff at, at our athletes. Um, what are you doing to deal with, uh, to deal, to stand in for swimming right now, if you're doing anything at all? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm doing my stretch cords every day. Um, um, but like probably just about like maybe like seven to 10 minutes of stretch cords. Um, sometimes I'll do a little bit more. Uh, and yeah, I think just throwing, having the Space to throw in more of that core work, um, the, a lot of push-ups and uh, and like horizontal rows, mm -hmm. giving myself some really amazing doms in my shoulder after one particular workout. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Just walk around like this horrible. all day next day. I, I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and also not really worrying about it a whole lot. Um, I know that, you know, the majority of us aren't swimming and except for those like really lucky people who live in the South and have open water that they can swim in. Um, I also, though, I did just get from Blue 70 the like, I have their thermal wetsuit and I just got the cap and the gloves and the booties. And as soon as it's double digit temperatures outside, I'm going to attempt to go and swim in our ocean right now. It's like, uh, close to like eight to nine degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is. And That's it's like forties. Yeah. forties. <laughs> yeah. It's forties. So it's very, very cold. Um, however, I do have a friend here who's a channel swimmer and she has been doing some like ice 
swimming too, which is just in, she's crazy. But I've been getting like tips on okay, okay, Jesse, like what's the what's the water temperature like? What kind of workouts are you doing? Like what can I expect when I get in this, that kind of cold weather water? So, but as soon as I'm gonna try it out. I mean, it's also not the smartest thing for me because when the water is super cold, I get my lung pulmonary edema stuff. So I have to be super careful, but um, I am like, I'm very tempted to get in the cold water a little bit earlier than, than usual this spring. That ice swimming stuff terrifies me. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. nope. <laughs> I can't do it. My friend Ed who's usually on these um, in New York, uh, swims in the Hudson Valley and he's done some of the, like the Vermont races where they cut out holes and uh, like lanes in the ice and you do like a hundred butterfly in ice water. It just sounds like, sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Chris, you look like there's a question in the chat. Um, Enid wants to know, this is a great question. I just love its its uh, its clarity. Favorite workout, period. Favorite workout, period. But that, gosh, now I have to I have to choose between swim, bike, run. Can um, I choose like one? Ooh, yeah, out of ab each? Absolutely, you can. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll start with the swim. Um. There's a um. There's a Tower 26 workout that is like 11 by 150, and it's kind of like a like a race simulation in a way. Um, and I do it at we have in the summer we have Kit's Pool here, which is 150 yards long, and so from end to end it's 150 yards. It's like one giant lane that you like swim out on one side of the pool and like back on the other it's amazing it's outdoor it's right on the beach it's where I basically spend my summer it's glorious and this workout is so perfect for it because it's 100 it's exactly 150 yards so it's 11 by 150 and I think <clears throat> it's like I, I don't know if I'm going to remember it all super correctly but you the first 150 is fast it's like fast and then and you jump out of the water at the other side and then you jump back in and then it's it's like uh iron man effort and then the next one is it's like uh, yeah i'm not gonna i can't remember it but it's like basically 11 by 150. i can i can like write it out and send send it off yeah, to you guys if you want we'll, we'll um, sound, find yeah, some way of distributing it I, I, I can't, but it's like basically a mixture of like fast Ironman to half Ironman pace and like a, like a moderate, like 70% uh, effort and you kind of, and it's like mixed up. So you might have like one fast and then one moderate and then two fast and then one easy and then one moderate. And yeah, it's, it's super cool. It's like very much a, a fartlek kind of thing, but it's hard and it's, it's so fun. It's really great. I love it. Okay, the bike. Okay, bike. Um, favorite bike workout. So I, I am kind of a fan of like the short but sweet uh, intervals, like of like doing more anaerobic mm. stuff, um, just because it's. I mean. I know that I'm supposed to love hurting on the bike, but I love when it's just a little block and then you get to go easy and then a little block of like really hard. And then, and one of the workouts that um, I do quite often in the, in my Ironman build is for an anaerobic work is um, 30 seconds on 15 seconds off. So 30 seconds as hard as you can go. 15 seconds as easy, easy as you can go. And you do that. 10 times through <clears throat> and then you take like a five minute break and then repeat that like up to three times. Uh, so it's like seven and a half minutes of, of like your, those about 15 seconds starts to feel like a blink. Um, yeah. And we do it, you can do it like on a flat road, but it's, it's actually really nice to do on that. Uh, I do it on one of our mountains here. Um, and so uh, it's, 
you basically are doing it on a climb so you don't have any traffic or stoplights or anything like that and you don't you can like practically fall off your bike and it's safe <laughs> because you're not going super fast get ready cbcg athletes for the Richmond <laughs> special showing up on <laughs> everywhere <laughs> Oh, it's so hard, but it's so, it's like short, but sweet. And it's like fun to see like, oh, what did my, what were my, what did I get my watts up to, you know, this time was like 400 or 500 or 600 or what for those 30 seconds. And it's like, it's like a short chunk of time that you can just like, just let it go. Right. It's like long enough that you have to pace it a tiny bit, but um, you just like see what you can do and see how you, how long you can hold it for. Um, and then the run. So running, um, you know what, gosh, again, I, my mind goes to like the, sh like a short, um, like the Monaghetti stuff. Mm, um, I, yeah, I spent a summer like leading or actually training up to South Africa a couple of years ago. I did a lot of Monaghetti stuff and yeah, I really liked it. I, even on the treadmill or on the road, I would do both. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I really like just like getting that leg speed up and having those shorter intervals and like, I like the ladder stuff so that like you get up, I would do it up to like 90 seconds and then would like go back down the ladder. I know that there are different versions and stuff, but I basically, if anybody doesn't know what the Monteghetti said, it's like how I did it basically was like 15 seconds. Uh, 15 seconds on 15 seconds off times two and then 30 seconds on 30 seconds off times two and then 45 seconds a minute and then one time 90 seconds and then back down the ladder awesome it's one of those workouts that seems undaunting at the front and by the time you get up to the 90 second one you're like oh god this is really yeah. hard <laughs> yeah yeah Hashtag intensity is a treat in the chat box on this. <laughs> um, we're going to go with, uh, we have one more question in the chat. Uh, Molly, do you want to okay. grab that one? Yeah. Um, so Ashley has another question and that is, what is the hardest race you have ever completed? <clears throat> so the hardest race that I have ever completed um, is probably... Well, I think there are there are two hardest races that I've ever completed um, in the world of triathlon. I would say um, my um, uh, my first Ironman was probably in Cozumel was probably one of the hardest races that I've ever done um i remember sitting at the finish line of that race and i think it's like part of it was probably not like not knowing how it felt to finish an iron man um but i remember sitting in the post-race area with like a piece of pizza in my hand and i think for about 30 minutes like actually 30 minutes i just sat there and like stared at this piece of pizza and was like, I know I have to eat this piece of pizza. And I know at some point I have to move. At some point I have to like collect all of my things and get back home. But I have no idea how I'm gonna do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and yeah, and I, I'm just remembering like, you know, trying to finish that race and the run and the heat, it was, it was pretty, pretty brutal. Um, however, I also, uh, I think it was, yeah, it wasn't last year, but the year before I did a gravel race called Walla Walla Grit. And it was, um, it didn't, you know, the profile of it didn't look super challenging. Um, I thought, oh, it's going to take about five hours to do it's sort of the profile was like, oh, it goes up a climb and then it's like rolling up here and then like a big descent down and that and finish through. I don't remember the distance. It was probably about a like like maybe 70 to 80 miles, 120 about 120 kilometers. Um and I ended up um this 
so the climb part was just fine it was like no okay yeah sure and then we got to this like flat section of the profile where it's sort of rolling and it was like some of the most technical and uncomfortable gravel i have ever ridden and i was bouncing all around because my tire pressure was like way too high uh and i was like i almost got off my bike and just like started crying um i was so mad at this course and it ended up instead of five hours it took seven and a half hours and i got to the last aid station which was like right before this big descent and i remember hearing in this in the briefing or reading in like the race manual that there was going to be um growlers of beer at this aid station and i was like where's the beer um, and I had like two little shots of beer because they just had those the little like plastic Dixie cups and just like two little shots of beer. And it was like the most glorious thing I have ever tasted in my <laughs> entire life. Um, and then proceeded to go down this descent that, of course, was like just like so full of washboard and yeah. like, you know, was just like vibrating all the way down and you know and um hoping that my hands were going to stay on the handlebars and i literally crossed the finish line and and like burst into tears i was just like that was so hard it was so hard um and and i ended up finishing like third overall in the race of like the whole race like out of everybody um, which I was just like, oh, this is amazing. And like, I can't believe. And so like, I must have obviously been pushing myself, but um, like it was, yeah, it was, that was one of the craziest experiences that I, it's one of those things where you like really learn how, how much you can push yourself. Mm -hmm. It was in scenarios like that. Um, yeah. So that I, that, that, if, if I think of any of the hardest things that I've ever done, that's one of them. Is that Walla Walla grit? And I haven't been back since, but <laughs> I've been tempted. <laughs> that's so hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know. Let's see. I know. I just said. I know. I said last question. Well, we we have two really good ones. One one really quick. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Favorite flavor of noon. Favorite flavor of noon um, is right now. I am really loving um, the lemon lime, and and I I love being the like I know in the big in like the larger bottles like not you have like the little bottle size and you have the large bottle size. I I like mine extra sparkly, and so I put two tabs in the yes. larger bottle. I didn't even know. You <laughs> I've never thought to do that. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the good move you because one, you're yeah. getting the correct amount of sodium also. Oh, nice. Great. Nice. Yeah. Um, so the last question that's in there is a throwback to what we were talking about earlier. Um, but before I get into that, um, I wanted to make sure to point out that Kirby, who's posing this question, also needs you to know that she is behind the um, the haranguing of the wadi custom to get super kitty swim gear um yeah. so she's she's on that she is leading that charge and uh and yeah it's it's on um i would not ever bet against kirby um <laughs> a powerful force of good um but uh her question is that she loves the art behind you and she wants to know if you can if you can speak a little bit to that oh sure well what, what do you mean like tattoos or like what press behind you oh the art behind me yeah. oh gosh yeah yeah so um this is a, a print um it's actually like like someone is this artist marco barakowski um who is a canadian artist in ontario hopefully moving to bc soon um it's literally like a print of this giant um i mean i can show you a little bit here actually how big it is like it's a big tree a big tree um uh it's called what does he call it stave oak it's a stave oak and um yeah it's literally a print of uh, a massive tree trunk and um i was telling these guys i um 
so I discovered Marco this Christmas at one of these like holiday um, artisan fairs in Vancouver that he was at. And I literally like we had spent an hour and a half at this um, craft fair and like I had gone through like all of the booths and we were basically leaving and his was the last one. And I walked by and I actually like had to stop and turn away and burst into tears because I was just so moved by these prints um and ended up I now we have between Steph and my family and I I think we have four of his prints um and for me it was like it's kind of like a like a representation of um of our planet and like the I had just um finished reading a book um about the basically the history of our planet and like from the big bang to like creation of the of the actual physical planet and then like how all the structures on the on the surface were created and then like how life started and like the fluctuations that that life on earth has gone through and to me, this was like this, this like tangible representation of time on our planet. Um, and it was, I just, I love it. And so it was something that I wanted to be reminded of um, as much as possible. And that's why I am just populating all of my homes <laughs> with his prints. That's awesome. Well, Rach McBride, uh, thank you so much for being our, the inaugural um, guest on the Community Spotlight here at the Endurance School. Um, we could talk to you all uh, all throughout the night, um, but um, it's so good to see you. And um, I really hope that, uh, yeah, I really hope that you're staying safe and healthy up there. Thank you. I, yeah, I know we could just like, I could totally just sit here all night and chat. <laughs> I love it. Um, and thank you. Thanks everybody for all of the questions. It's really, really cool to ask some questions that I haven't been asked, that I haven't been asked before. Um, and, uh, and I really, uh, love all of your support and absolutely. I mean, it's so wonderful to see you too. I miss you a lot. I miss you too. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just so great to see your face. I do have one announcement to everybody. Um, so Rach was very kind in the use of the super kitty image. Um, so because of that, our very first custom emote, uh, which will be appearing in the chat at some point, as soon as it is approved by, um, by Twitch and maybe already is going to be a super kitty. So to see in, if it has, uh, has shown up yet. It's going to be the end six uh, super kitty will be the emote tag. So copy that. And um, the end six is our endurance school um, assigned like pre pre emote thing. Um, but it will be available as an uh, as an emote in chat as soon as it's been approved. We just put it in a couple minutes before we got started, so it hasn't been approved yet. But um, but the the super kitty emotes will be the very first endurance school custom emote. So thank you for letting us do that. That's really that is so cool. Screenshot of it as soon as it happens. <laughs> yes, please do. Yes, I want to see this. Yeah. So anytime how can, somebody. How can we get that? So anytime anybody cheers for us, and cheering is the way that people kind of like um, support channels on Twitch, um, instead of like, uh, at the moment, it's kind of like a diamond. Uh, uh, when they do that in the future, it will be your Super Kitty logo. That's so great. We need more Super Kitties out there. We really do. We really do. <laughs> you, you, have, you have created a lot of Super Kitties, Rach. So <laughs> just keep, keep, doing the, uh, keep doing the good work. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Meg. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Well, um, to all of you guys watching, thank you so much for coming and joining us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, don't forget, Endurance Spin tomorrow morning at 8. Um, watch me and Molly slog through another 90 minutes on our trainer. Um, Amy, Amy BT Yoga, uh, 8 a.m. on Sunday. Um, so that's the schedule for the rest of the week. And then we are right back into our normal schedule which you can see by simply scrolling down, it's right below all of our talking heads. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in and uh, here's to a happier and faster tomorrow.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Rich. It was so good to see you. So good. <laughs> <sighs>